spite of Father's Day, we won't have a service here tonight. We want you to worship the Lord and, uh, with your family and just uh, uh, be with them. And uh, also, no walls, which would have been this afternoon, in light of the weather, the forecasted weather, it's, uh, they're going to cancel no walls. So there'll be no no walls today if you were going up there uh, to help with that. But uh, if you would bow with me, I would love to open us up in a word of prayer. Dear Lord, our God and our Heavenly Father, we love you, Lord, and we just praise your holy name today, God, and I just thank you, Lord. This is Father's Day, Lord, and I thank you for my dad, Lord, and what my dad has meant to me and, and my parents, Lord, and, and I've been thinking about that this week, Lord. Uh, outside of you, nobody's helped me more than my parents, Lord, and that's the way it should be. And Lord, we just praise you this morning for Father's Day and I, all the fathers and what they mean to their families, and Lord, just the role that you give them. And I pray at the end of this, this message, Lord, that we may greater understand what that role means. And, and I just, Father God, this morning, I am so unworthy to stand here, Lord, and I just ask forgiveness for my sins, Lord, and, and I ask forgiveness for my failures. And Lord, I, I know, Lord, that we're all unworthy, but sometimes we just, uh, sometimes, Lord, we just seem that... We're just rags, Lord, and we understand that, Lord. I just, I just praise you this morning, Lord, and I just ask you to hide me behind the cross, and I know my only hope's in you. And if it weren't for that promise, Lord, I don't know what we'd do, Lord. It'd be hard to face tomorrow without the promise we have in you, Lord. I just thank you for that promise, and I just ask you today that you might make your message known, Lord. Just use me, Lord, as a messenger, Lord. I know I'm just a jar of clay, but I ask you to use me for your glory. In Jesus' name I do pray, amen. If you would like to be turning to Ephesians chapter 4, uh, today's Father's Day, and I didn't even realize how well this message went with Father's Day. I'd already planned on this message until I studied it out. I was like, God, oh, God's a big God. He's way bigger than I am. But uh, anyway, last week we talked about the first uh, portion of Ephesians chapter 4, actually kind of the middle portion of Ephesians chapter 4. But last week we, we talked about that God had empowered his people. And we talked, you know, it says in Ephesians 4 there that in 11 that he gave some to be apostles and some to be prophets and some to be pastors and some to be teachers. We talked about that last week. And, and then it's got that word too, you know. To prepare God's people. He had a purpose. You know, God had a purpose when he set up the church. God had a purpose when he set up his body to prepare God's people for works of service. That's what he wants in my life is to make me a useful vessel in his hands. And, and this week we're going to talk about the other side of that. You know, or no, the continuation of that. Let me say that word. Actually, what we was talking about last week, and me and Ralph talked about this sitting out there on the bench a little bit. And, and I wanted to, to try to explain something. Salvation in itself happens in a moment. The, you know, the famous words in Amazing Grace, the hour that I first believed. And, and there's no way that you can say today that I'm more saved than I was last week, unless you weren't saved last week. Because if you're saved, you're as saved as you're ever going to get. Amen. When your name's in the Lamb's Book of Life, it's in the Lamb's Book of Life. To be saved is to be saved, and you can't get any more saved than you already are. You're saved, you know what I mean? The Bible says that, that, that when, when, when I'm saved, my sins are forgotten. They're gone as far as the east is from the west. Well, what about the sin that I haven't committed yet? It's forgotten too, you know what I mean? I'm saved yesterday and today and tomorrow if my heart sets repentant and I have salvation. But last week... What we were talking about wasn't so much salvation as it is transformation. You know, we, we, God is redeeming us back to our original purpose. He's taking us back to what he wanted us to be. He's restoring us. And I don't know about you, but sometimes I look back at the, the week behind me. This morning is a good example of it. I look back at the week behind me and I get a little bit discouraged at my transformation. You know what I mean? Because I'm not as far along as I wished I was. Now, I know I'm saved. I know I'm saved. I know my name's in the Lamb's Book of Life. But this transformation thing, it's big, you know. God didn't call me out of the world so I could still look like the world. God called me out of the world so he could make me a picture of him. 
Today, that's what I want to talk about. I want you to start reading with me. We're going to read there at Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17. And this is where we, we're going to pick up where we left off last week. And Ephesians 4, 17 says this. Paul says, so I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding, separated from life because separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that's due them, that's in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity with a continual lust for more. Sound like real bad people, don't they? Go on ahead and nod your head what you think. It sounds like real bad people. These real bad people are you. And me. Amen. Listen to what he says in verse 17. So I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord that you, guess who I'm talking to? You. Ah, you, you got that. You must no longer live as the Gentiles do. Now, I didn't do real good in the English class, but that word must no longer means that I must have been doing it in the first place, right? Paul says, I want to tell you something as the church. Now, he's talking to the church here. You must no longer live as the Gentiles do and the futility of their thinking. Now, I tell, I've told you this before. I think most people have a missed understanding of God. They think God is like a game of whack-a-mole. You know what I mean? I've told you this before. You know, you know what whack-a-mole is? I used to love that game. You know what I mean? It, it, it's a game you play at the arcade where the little moles got all them holes and they come up out of it. You got that stick and you got to hit them when they come up out of the hole, you know? And a lot of people view God as a big God up there with this big stick waiting on you to mess up and stick your head up out of the hole so he can hit you, you know what I mean? And so, so many people view that this God isn't this merciful, loving God, but he's this God who's just waiting for you to mess up so he can hit you real good. But John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever would believe in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Now let me tell you what it doesn't say. It doesn't say that God so loved the good people in the world that he gave his only Son. It says that God so loved everybody in the world that he gave his only Son. But John 3, 17 says he didn't come to condemn the world. That wasn't his plan. He didn't come with a big stick to hit everybody that messed up. He wouldn't come into this world to condemn the world, but to save the world from its sin. John 3, 18. Whoever does not believe that Jesus is the Son of God stands condemned already. Man, that's so heartbreaking. You know, God looked down at me in this world and he seen me as I was a wretched piece of junk. A messed up sinner. My life's all messed up because God let me have control of it. <laughs> Amen. Amen. That's the truth. God made me a free choice being and that's all I needed. I messed it right up. And then God looked down at me and he had mercy on me and he loved me and he sent his son as a way out. He never wanted condemnation. He wanted salvation for me. And this salvation took my sin away, but God don't want to stop there. He wants to transform me into a likeness of Christ. That's what he wants. God wants me to have everything he's got. He wants me to have his love and his joy and his mercy and his peace. He wants me to have all that stuff. I like him words. Don't that word peace. Whew, I like that word. I just can't wait for that total peace thing. The Bible says that when you get to heaven, you'll have total peace. And I don't know about you, but when I think about that, I am ready to go. You know, I, mean? I used to think that heaven was going to be the most boringest place in the world. When I was a kid sitting in church, I thought that heaven was going to be sitting around listening to some old angel saw on a harp for all of eternity. And I said, man, that's awful, you know. But the more I understand about God, the more I realize that heaven is being in the perfect presence of God. It is share, God wanted to share everything he has with me. Peace and joy and love and hope. But isn't it weird 
that Christians who profess that they want to spend their eternity with God don't want to spend their life living like him. Now think about what I'm saying for a minute. I want to spend my eternity with him, man. I'm all jacked up about that. I want to spend my eternity with God. But isn't it weird that somebody who wants to spend their whole eternity with this great father don't want to spend their life with this father? So Paul says, I want to tell you something. I don't suggest it. Verse 17 says, I insist on it in the Lord that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do. Now think about this word, in the futility of their thinking. Now I'm not real smart, so I had to get the Webster on this one. The word futility means worthless. To be of no value. In other words, Paul said that the world is thinking about temporary things. First of all, the first description he has of a Gentile, listen to me for a minute, the first description he has as a Gentile is those whose focus is on worldly things. Does that fit? Amen. Amen. You spent your life worrying about temporary things a little bit? Because I spent all my life thinking about temporary things, it seems. The, the Gentile has his focus on things of this world. That's what he's thinking about, what he can have right now, what he can get right now, what he can feel right now. You know, you've seen that commercial about the tax refund, it's my money and I want it now, you know. And that's kind of, that's a Gentile way of thinking. We ain't worried about tomorrow, we want to do what we can do today. Paul says you can't live like the Gentiles do anymore who think worldly and are darkened in their understanding. Their light is dim. Now there are a lot of you saying, well, if it, if it makes you a Gentile, I'm one. If you're a dim thinker, you know. But, but, but wait a minute here. He says that they're darkened in their understanding due to the ignorance because of the hardening of their heart. And I want you to follow me for a minute. You see, that they're not, they don't, un, it's not that they can't get it. It's they've chosen not to get it. The ignorance that's in them is due to the hardening of their hearts. When you go back and look at the language in which it was wrote in in the Greek, it wasn't God who hardened their hearts. It was they who hardened their hearts. Now I want to ask you a question. This is honesty time. You ever done anything you know wouldn't right for you done it? Yeah, that's who we are with Gentiles. As a matter of fact, he just don't say that they've hardened their hearts. He says that they have lost all sensitivity. You remember when you was a little kid and somebody would say a cuss word and you'd go, <gasps> You remember that? It's been a long time since I've done that. You know what I mean? You notice if you stand beside the dumpster long enough, it don't stink no more. And in this world, we, we, if we're not careful, we lose our sensitivity to the things of God and the things outside of God. We're not sensitive about it anymore. It stops bothering us. The world don't bother the Gentile thinker anymore. He's lost all sensitivity. And listen to this. And given himself, given himself over to sensuality. Now, the Bible uses that word sensuality a lot. You know what that means? They live based on how they feel. They do whatever they feel like doing. They've lost all sensitivity to God's conviction, and they live the way they feel like living. Now, when I read the description of them terrible people, I look at that and say, that's me. That's a perfect description of me. That's who I was. I lived the way I wanted to live. I'd done what I know was wrong. Even though I knew it was wrong, I had lost my sensitivity to the Spirit of God. I was futile in my thinking because I wasn't worried about eternal things. I was thinking about temporary things. Man, I was thinking about what felt good right now, Paul says, but I tell you, you can't do that anymore. Why? I'm glad you asked. Listen to what he says. In verse 20, you, however, didn't come to know Christ that way. Surely you heard of him when you were taught in accordance with the truth that's in Jesus. You were taught with regard to your former way of life 
to put off the old self which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires and to be made new in the attitudes of your mind to put on a new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Paul said, let me tell you something. You didn't get saved living like the world lives. I'm going to put this in simple terms for you. You didn't get saved living like the world is. You can't get saved living like you feel like living. You can't get saved thinking about temporary things. You can't get saved with a darkened understanding that refuses the Holy Spirit's conviction. And if you're here today, you got saved when you heard the truth of Jesus Christ and you responded because the Holy Spirit pricked your heart. If you got saved, you were saved on the truth of Jesus Christ because you can't be saved no other way. Amen? Amen. We got to get that. You know what I mean? We got to get that far. The Bible says there is no other name under heaven in which a man must be saved other than the name of Jesus Christ. So if you're here today and you're saved, it was the gospel that saved you. It was the gospel, Paul says. And you were taught in accordance with your old way of life to put off the old self which is being corrupted by its evil desires. Man, that's hard to swallow, ain't it? That yourself has got evil desires. But that's the truth. All temptation is, happens when you are dragged away and enticed by your own Evil desire. That's what James says. I used to hate reading that verse because that made sin my fault. <gasps> what are you saying? That I actually desire the things I don't know? Yeah. Because that's what flesh is. You see, when Jesus Christ put that tree, when God in creation, Christ put that tree in the garden that we weren't supposed to eat of, it set a great battle up, the battle between good and evil. We have a fleshly battle going on within us. We have the spirit who's leading us God's way and the flesh who's drawing us the world's way. And we're kind of torn between which way to go. You, you, you feel me? You know what I'm talking about? It, 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 you feel like somebody's pulling this way and somebody's pulling this way and you're in the middle and some days you'd cut your right arm off to do it God's way and cut your left arm off to do it Satan's way just one more time. And if I don't sound churchy, I'm sorry, but I've lived that way my life. Some people say you don't understand addiction. Oh, yes, I do. I can write you books on addiction. I understand addiction perfectly. Addiction is doing what you hate and not understanding why you're doing it, but you can't wait to do it again. If you've ever had addiction, you know what I'm talking about. You don't get it, but you do it. You can't explain it. You hate it. But I want to tell you something. Addiction ain't the only sin. There's all kinds of sins going on in people's lives that they know is wrong and they hate it, but they do it anyway. I used to plan on sinning. Some of you here might have planned on it with me. You know what I mean? Paul, Paul says, now listen to this, if we're going to be saved and transformed, we can't live like the world lives anymore. I didn't get saved that way and I ain't never going to get transformed that way. That's pretty simple, ain't it? You didn't get saved that way and you ain't going to get transformed that way. So live different than the world. That was Paul's message. Live different. You know, when God told him to be the circumcised, you know what that word means, the circumcised? It means the cutting away. But, but in a broad definition of circumcised, it means to be the different. To set apart. To be different. They were supposed to be different than everybody in the world. If everybody was circumcised, it wouldn't be different, would it? No. It wouldn't be nothing to it if everybody was. That's why he told his people to be. And he told us in the New Testament to be circumcised of the heart. To cut away the fleshly desires of the world and to live for him. And that, so he goes on in verse 25. Or listen to this. I think it gets deep here. Therefore... Each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to his neighbor. We, for we are all members of one body, and your anger don't sin. Don't let the sun go down while you're still angry. Don't give the devil a foothold. He that's been stealing must steal no longer, but must work. Do something useful with your own hands, that you may have something to share with those in need. Don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what's helpful for building others up. 
in accordance to their needs that it may benefit those who listen. Don't grieve the Spirit of God of whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, and brawling, and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as Christ, God, forgave you. In Christ, God forgave me. And that's what he's called me to do. Now, let me put this in simple terms for you. It, you, didn't get, you didn't get saved by living like the world, and you're never going to get transformed by living by the world. So live out your faith. That, that, that's his challenge here. Live out your faith. And, and listen to what he says. Those of you who've been lying, get real and get truthful. Now you're saying, well, I know some liars. But what about you? You say, man, I don't lie. I'm a gospel believing guy. I don't lie, but I want to tell you something. Before you say you don't lie, I want you to ask yourself, have you ever lied to you? Because that's the biggest form of liars I know is the people who are lying to themselves. I'm going to tell you something. I ain't in the habit of lying, but I've lied to myself so much I, don't, I can't even keep record of it anymore. I've told myself I was going to fix it. I've told myself I was going to get better. I've told myself I was going to do something else, but I was right back in the same boat. And I lied to God. So he that lies, don't let him lie anymore. He that, he that acts in his rage, let him be kind and not let rage take over. He that steals, let him work. He that's robbing God, let him give back to God. Now listen to this one. He who his words are tearing down, let him speak in such a way that builds up. What Paul's trying to say is whatever you do, do it like you was doing it for the Lord. You say, well, I don't understand what we're driving at here. Let me tell you what we're driving at. Look at 5.1. Ephesians 5.1. This is, this is today's message. Be imitators of God, therefore, as dearly loved children, and live a life of love just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and a sacrifice to God. Think about this for a second. As dearly loved children, be imitators of God. I was thinking about that this morning. You know, they used to come into our class when we was like first, second grade. And they'd ask everybody in the class, boys and girls alike, what they wanted to be when they grew up. And you could almost bet, guarantee that whatever their daddy was is what the little boys wanted to be. And whatever their mamas was is what the little girls wanted to be. If their mama was a nurse, they wanted to be a nurse. If their daddy was a mechanic, they wanted to be a mechanic. You know what I mean? Why? Because they loved them, man. That's the biggest inspiration they ever had in their life. Now, we're here today in today's Father's Day, and it's cool to be a dad, but I want to tell you something. There's great responsibility when it comes to being a dad, and there's great responsibility when it comes to being God. But I've learned something in my short little time of being a dad. I only got one half of the deal. Now, follow me for a minute. I can teach my kids everything I know. I can beg with them. I can plead with them to do it the right way, but when it gets right down to it, they got to choose which way they're going to do it. Amen? I want to tell you something. Life is not on God. He's the giver of life. He's the author of life, the redeemer of life. But what my life ends up being is on me. He's taught me everything that I need to know for life and godliness. It's right there in that book. He's done everything he can do to redeem my life from sin, to restore me, to transform me. But when it gets right down to it, am I going to put what I see in God in me? Be imitators of God, therefore, as dearly loved children. Man, when I was a kid, when you was a kid, did you ever just idolize somebody? Did you ever just want to be like somebody when you've got all kinds of idols, man? When wrestling come on, I was the macho man. You know what I mean? Look at this one, brother. I was just transformed into the macho man when, when, when wrestling come on. You know, that's who I was going to be. And then, man, we, we'd have a John Wayne movie on, and I'd be walking around the house with a 45 on. You know what I mean? 
I was going to be John Wayne. All kids do that. Man, we idolize somebody. Right? But I want to tell you something. You know who set the normal at my house? I mean, I like Randy Savage. He's dead and gone now. I like Randy Savage, but never did I think chrome glasses and a bandana and veins sticking out of your neck saying, oh, yeah, what's reality? You know what I mean? I liked it. When I was a kid, I wanted to be like him for the hour and a half or two hours it was on TV. But the truth is, Randy Savage didn't set my normal. My parents did. My parents set my normal. I want to tell you something. Today, you are going to set your kids as normal. And how are you going to do that? By how you imitate what a godly person looks like. That's how you're going to do it. You realize that the way your parents worship God is your normal? I've told people this here before, but I got to tell you this on Father's Day because, because this, this, this right here, this, this, this little incident, as simple as it is, transformed my understanding about being a dad. We was at a Christian concert, and I am very, I, I shouldn't say this, this ain't churchy, but I'm judgmental about people that don't look like me. You know what I'm talking about? I love them and I want them to go to heaven, but I'm judgmental. You know what I mean? I see some old boy over there. I say, boy, that's a real hand right there, guaranteed. Don't even know him, but just by the way he's dressed. I'm, I'm being honest. I'm working through that. I'm praying through it. But that's my, my, that's my on me. And I seen this guy coming up the bleachers in a blue slicker. And I hate slickers. I hated slickers when I was a kid. I wouldn't wear one of them to a chicken fight because you can't sneak up on a corpse. Everywhere you go, they rub together and go, you know what I mean? And so this guy's coming up the stands and you can hear him coming. And, and I turn around and he's in blue from head to toe, baby blue slicker. I said, Lord have mercy, my God. And, and, and there's a little kid right behind him in a baby blue slicker, looked like a little mini me, and he's going, you know, and, and man, they're standing up there. And, 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 and so I, I just said, Lord be, that guy come out in public wearing that thing, you know what I mean? And, and, and I'm standing up here going all of myself and, and, and casting crowns of singing and they're singing a worship song. And in the middle of this song, I look over at this dude in the slickety suit and he's got his hands raised to the heaven and he's praising God with every ounce of oomph he's got. And there's tears from his eyes to halfway down his shirt. And right beside him, this little boy who looks like a carbon copy of him has got his hands raised to the heavens and he's praising God with everything he's got and there's tears running down his face. And if God himself had to pick me up and shook me, I wouldn't have felt no stupider. And I said, God, I want what that guy's got. I want what he's got. Because that guy right there don't give a rip what nobody in this place thinks, just you. And that little boy, his hero, it's focused on the right thing. That little boy's normal was praising God with everything you got, no matter who's looking. And I want to tell you something. If I can leave my kids with that, I don't care what they bury me in. They can put me in a slicker if they want to. If I leave my kids with that, amen, baby. You know what I mean? Amen! Be imitators of God as dearly loved children, which Paul said, if you want to be transformed, live it. Live it. I was thinking of that country music song. I used to love it. I can't remember the artist, but he says, I'm starting to see my father in me. I notice I talk the way he talks. I notice I walk the way he walks. I'm starting to see my father in me. You know, of your earthly daddy, it's bound to happen. That's your genetics. But of your spiritual father, it's a decision. And if God's your father, your chosen father, and you live it out, you're going to start to see your father in you. You're going to start to notice that you walk the way he walks. You're going to start to notice that righteousness is your decree. You're going to start to notice that you talk the way he talks, that whatever you do lifts up and doesn't tear down, and it points to his glory and not to his discredit. 
Paul wasn't saying, he wasn't just, you just understand, he was talking to the church in Ephesians. He was talking to the church in Ephesus. He wasn't talking to the people out on the streets, to the worldly people. He was talking to the people inside the church and he was telling them, I'm telling you this, you can't keep living like the world's living because you wasn't saved that way and you'll never get transformed that way. So if you want to be transformed into the likeness of Christ, be an imitator of God himself. Start walking in his tracks. I look at myself and I got a policy. I hate being a fake. I hate fake. There may be a lot of things said about me when I die, but it won't be fake because I hate fake. I got zero use for fake. Somebody acts like one person in one crowd, another person in another crowd. I'm pretty much done. I hate fake. I'm me. That's all I know how to be. But I want to tell you something. Sometimes I get so discouraged with being me that I can't stand it. I want to be what I want to be. But I don't know how to be it. I know I'm saved. But I want to be Christ's likeness. And sometimes it's like I step up to the plate and swing with everything I got and the ball lands right in front of me. I can't do it. But he can. He can. And he wants to. It all depends on if I want him to. You know what I mean? Because life is not about knocking it over the fence every time. Life's about getting up one more time than you get knocked down. Salvation is a one, it, 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 when, it's, when you're saved, you're saved. You can never be any more saved than you already are. But God just didn't come to the world to bring salvation. He came to bring restoration and transformation to the life of every believer. God wants to give me everything he has. Not just to get out of hell for free card, but he wants to give me the peace and joy and love and mercy and forgiveness that I see in Jesus Christ. I want to tell you something, folks. I ain't there yet, but I want to be. And if you're here today and you want to be, you're in good company. We're going to have a hymn of invitation. If you don't know Jesus Christ as Lord, I want to tell you something. He didn't come to condemn you. He come to save you. That's all he wants to do, save you. He wants to wipe away your tears and take away your sin. He wants to take you out of the mud and the mess of life and clean you up like the, like the prodigal son. He wants to put a ring on your finger and a robe on your back. And he'll do it if you let him. But he don't want to stop there. I want to tell you something. I've sat by a lot of people's bedsides, and I was thinking about this before Sunday school started. I have never heard anybody say, I wish I'd have took on more overtime at work. What I should have done was worked a little more overtime. It's been all right if I'd done that. I never heard nobody say anything about I wish we'd have had the kids more involved in activities. Never. I mean, I've, seen, I've, I've sat beside a lot of dying men, but I've never heard them talk about they wish they spent more time at the ballpark or the movie theater or took the kids on some vacation across the world. Never. Never. I've never heard anybody talk about any kind of temporary thing on their dying bed. Every deathbed conversation I ever had with somebody, the only thing they wanted to talk about was eternal things. You know why? Because that's the only thing that matters then. Amen. That's all that matters. There's going to come a day that whatever you do in this life outside of Jesus Christ ain't going to amount to nothing. Folks, why wait till that day to start? I know what I'm living for. I know my day's coming. I might as well be ready. I want to live in such a way. The Bible says live in such a way that even your enemies live at peace with you. They might not like you, but they'll know where your heart is. If you don't know who Jesus Christ is, please come. But if you do, and that transformation thing, if you're having as much trouble with it as me, I pray for you. But don't give up on yourself. Repentance isn't a one-time thing. It's an all-time thing. Transformation takes a lifetime, but don't quit. Just keep getting up. Won't you come as we sing our invitation hymn?